This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, our scriptural text today comes from St. John chapter 9, verses 1 down through verse 7. Notice the word of the Lord. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay of the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. I'm speaking today simply from the subject, sent. Sent. It's interesting to notice here that Jesus saw a man who had never seen before. This is extremely rare. Maybe a couple of folks in the Bible who were born blind, born blind. So they were blind from birth. Most of the other times that Jesus opened the eyes of the blind, they were people who had gone blind over the course of their life. But this is one of those rare individuals who was born blind. Can you imagine what it's like to have never seen the face of, the face of your, your mother or your father? To have never seen the sun? To have never seen green grass? And then all of a sudden for Jesus, to put a spittle of clay on the man's eyes and tell him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, and then you'll come again seeing. It, it, I wanted you to see here that though this man was born blind and he couldn't see Jesus, Jesus could see him. You see, Jesus can see you even when you can't see him. And just because he's silent doesn't mean that he's absent. He sees you, he hears you, no matter how isolated you might feel. You remember the handmaiden, Hagar, that was Hagar's, she was Sarah's handmaiden, and uh, she felt that Sarah was being harsh with her, and so she ran away from her, and God met her in a desert place, in a dry place, and God spoke to her. Uh, in, in notice in, in Genesis chapter 16 and verse 13, thereafter Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. And she also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? Can you imagine what it feels like to be an invisible person where nobody sees you? That's the way that Hagar felt. Serving in somebody else's house. Serving somebody else's husband. And she felt like the invisible woman that no matter what I do and how much I do, I'm not appreciated. Nobody sees what I'm doing. Ever felt like that? To where the things that you've done, how you've served, go unnoticed? But here in this desert place, she renamed God as the one who sees me. She realized that she was seen by someone who could see her. And uh, it changed her life. It changed her esteem about herself. It changed the destiny of the child that she was running away with, Ishmael. But I want you to notice here what um, the Bible says here in John 9, 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him 
who sent me while it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. And I want you to realize that God calls us to do something for him. In the same way that Jesus is sent, I've got news for you, you're sent too. If you belong to him. We have no right to sit when we've been sent. It bothers me when people call themselves standing on the promises but sitting on the premises. We are sent. Lay your hands on yourself. Say, I'm sent. Come on, lay it like you really mean and say, I am sent. I want you to know you are sent. You may not feel sent, but you are. You are. Jesus is the one sent by God the Father, and we join him in his assignment. I, I like the way that that same verse, John chapter uh, 9 and verse 4, reads in the New American Standard Bible. Notice it says, we must carry out the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And several other versions also put it this way, instead of it just being Jesus personally saying that I must work, several of the versions say, we must carry out the works of him who sent me as long as it is, is day. That lets us know that we join Jesus in his assignment. We are sent along with him. Can you imagine now, I was called into the ministry. The Lord, I first heard the voice of the Lord when I was seven years old. If I'm called to go, and you call to be joined to me, you sent too. Little did my wife know that when she fell at my feet at 16, <laughs> that because I was sent and she was joining someone who was sent, that that means that you're sent too. When you're joined with somebody that is sent, listen, we are one with Christ. The Father, Jesus said, the Father and I are one. And Jesus said, I want me and you to be one. So if Jesus is sent and we are one with him, we're sent too. We're called into the mission field as well. I, I, the, the idea is this. We are co-workers together with him, fellow laborers with him. You ever notice the scripture there? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and uh, verse 5 through 9. Notice. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed even as the Lord gave to each one? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he who plants nor he who waters anything, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are, here it is, laborers together with God. We are laborers together with God. We are laborers together with God. You are God's vineyard. You are God's building. But we are laborers together with him. We are his co-workers. Our God is ascending God. And let me just say this to you, that the only reason that God calls anyone is so that he can send them to accomplish an assignment on his behalf in the earth. The only reason that God calls anyone is so that he can send them to accomplish his assignment on his behalf in the earth. Now. Uh, to understand the, the sending nature of God, please understand it. God sent his son. God sent Jesus. Jesus, when he was here and he left, sent the Holy Ghost. And then God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost sent the church. Now we are that emissary. We are that army of people that go now in the name sent by God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. I hope you see that we serve ascending God. God sent Jesus. Jesus sent the Holy Ghost. God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost send us to represent him in the world. And he says, you're not going to go alone and unequipped, but I want you to go and tarry until you get some power. I want you to walk in anointing. 
I don't want you to just walk and hand out bread. I want you to be able to say, he tied my bow tie and he coming at a Chevrolet. He, he said, I want you to be able to go in power so that if somebody needs healing, you, you, and these signs shall follow them that believe, that are sent, that believe, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They shall cast out devils. He's not talking about himself. He's talking about those that believe. Are you a believer? If you are, you're sent. You're sent. You're sent. And you're not sent without backup help. God has equipped you to go in power and in strength and in might. You got the Holy Ghost. Discerning of spirits. Tongues, interpretations of tongue. I never will forget I was in a meeting and the power of the Holy Ghost came upon me and I began to speak. I was probably 18 years old. I began to speak in another language and then the interpretation came forth. And the woman, how would I ever know that here's a woman from Yugoslavia there? And she said to me, where did you learn my language? I've never been to Yugoslavia, sweetheart. I don't know your language, but God does. And isn't it amazing when I interpreted the word of the Lord, God was speaking to her about some issues in her life as a little girl back in her village in Yugoslavia by the power of the Holy Ghost. She had a doctorate degree and couldn't understand how a young man from Atlanta, Georgia was able to speak her language and tell her the deep secrets of her heart. You are not sent without power. That's why he says, go and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. Then he sent them out. Jesus gave gifts. He gave power to his disciples to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. He gave them power. You're not alone. Remember, God sent Jesus. Jesus sent the Holy Ghost. And Jesus, God and the Holy Ghost, send us as the church, as his representatives or ambassadors in the earth. And I want you to understand this, that the effectiveness of a church is not determined by how many it seats, but by how many it sends. It doesn't matter that you got 20,000 seats in your building. It doesn't matter how many are you sending in the name of Jesus. A, a real effective church is a sending church that empowers people and they take the gospel. It doesn't just sit, it sends. Have you ever written a text message and forgot to press send? Have you ever written an email and forgot to press send? The message doesn't get delivered, does it? And that's what happens when people get the word in them and they never hit send. But God's trying to send you and I just came today to tell you, you're sent. If there's a word in you, how dare you think that he's just going to let it sit? No, 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 no. It's in you so he can send you. It's bigger than you. The pain that you've been through, what you've been delivered out of, what you've had to pray through is bigger than just you. Whatever God has done in you, he's now going to do through you. You're sent, you're sent, you're sent, you're sent. You got a whole tribe. And here's my question to you. What are you waiting for to be sent? I mean, I mean are you really waiting to get all of your personal issues resolved? You know, well, as soon as I get my life all cleaned up and everything, you know, God work, because I'm going through some stuff right now. Uh, when is your exact expected due date for you to have all of your issues resolved? Just, just give me that date. When you're going to be finished with all of your stuff. Do you really honestly think that God waits until you get it all figured out before he sends you? Peter was still cussing. He's not going to wait for you to get all of your issues figured out before he sends you. And I want you to see here that Jesus, when he met this, this blind man from birth, he sent him before he healed him. I don't think you got the revelation of that. I said Jesus sent him before he healed him. He got a word before he got an answer. Don't sit back and wait 
until you think you've got everything worked out before God can use you. Now, if he can use a donkey, and if the master says, go there and tell them you're going to find a donkey tied up, tell them the master have need of him. Yeah, I know you've been tied up in debt and tied up in problems and tied up in stress and, and tied up in depression, and the master <laughs> has sent for you. Why are you tied up? Isn't it amazing that he would love to ride somebody who's been tied up, tangled up? But when Jesus rides you, <laughs> it's not about you, it's about the one that's riding you. And, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm just glad that he sends us before he even works everything out in us. But I do want you to understand that you really can't go in, your, in all of your own authority. You remember when uh, the disciples were in a, in a boat on the Sea of Galilee and they were in a storm. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes walking to them on the water and they look and they said, it's a ghost. And then Peter, you know Peter was so impetuous. Peter's always jumping out. He's... he's extremely contumacious. He's, he's, he's a confronter. And, and, and Peter says, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Well, it was Jesus. I mean, Peter really painted himself in a corner. It was Jesus. Jesus said, come on. When he actually put his leg outside of the boat and stepped on the water, he wasn't walking on the water. He was walking on the word. Jesus gave him a word and said, come. Come. Until he tells you to come, you have no authority. You have no support. You're stepping on something that is unstable until he gives a word saying, come. Jesus sent for him and said, come. When he stepped out, he didn't walk on the instability of the water. He walked out on the solidity of the word. So Jesus sent for him and gave him an authority. And I want you to know that uh, you remember in Esther chapter 8, how this little beauty queen, she had already died to herself. You see, when Esther, though she was married to the king, if you went to the king without being summoned, if he didn't send for you, you could die to go to him. You have to understand that when this little girl went and presented herself to the king, she was facing death, risking death, because the only thing that would stop you from dying if you went to see the king without being summoned, if, if he extended to you the royal scepter. And this is why she had to have her folks. She said, listen, I'm, I'm getting ready to go. I'm going to be sent now on your behalf. I need y'all to pray for me. She said, I need y'all to turn your plate down. I, I need y'all to really go in. I need, I'm talking about some deep intercession. I'm not talking about some little memorized kind of prayer that's, you know, rhyming on the, you know. She said, I, listen, I, I, need, I need snot. I need all of that. She's like, bring it. Y'all pray for me. She's like, y'all pray for me. Cause, and, and, and she had such a conviction that if I perish, I perish. And she went in without being summoned. He didn't send for her, but she was going for her people. She's going as, as an intercessor. When you go as an intercessor, you've had to die to yourself anyway. She was dying to herself as an intercessor. And he extended the royal scepter. And she knew when she got the royal scepter that she would live. But I want you to understand how every authorized person must be sent. Every authorized person must be sent. When you look at a missionary, a missionary is a, is a person sent on a religious mission, especially one that promotes Christianity in a foreign country. And then there's an emissary. An emissary is a person sent on a special mission, usually as a diplomatic representative. Then an ambassador. An ambassador is an accredit, accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country, but they are sent. And then we have an apostle. An apostle is a sent person. It comes from the Greek word apostolos, which literally means 
a sent one who sends other ones. So the apostle is not only sent, the apostle also sends others. They send others. They send others. And I want you to understand the process of God. God chooses us and then calls us, and it's not the other way around. God doesn't call you and then choose you. He chooses you and then calls you. He chooses you and then calls you. He chooses you and then calls you. I, I chose my wife and then I called her. <laughs> Jesus chooses us and then he calls you. See, you know when a man goes into a place, if he's going to come up on a woman, he, she, he sees her, something about her strikes him, and he chooses her, then he tries to slide into her DMs. <laughs> then he asks for her digits. But they choose you before they call you. Notice in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, and having chosen them, he called them to him. You notice that? You see the pattern? Having chosen them, he called them to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Yeah. Notice what Jesus did to his disciples. In John chapter 15 and verse 16. Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. I'm sending you so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. I chose you. You didn't choose me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I chose you and then I appointed you. I call you. I chose you and then I call you. Now let's look back at our text again at St. John chapter 9 verse 6 and 7. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Go, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. The Hebrew word there, Siloam, it meant sent. Isn't it interesting? This man's healing was predicated on his obedience to go where Jesus sent him. Yeah. Now he could have made an excuse. He could have said, listen, I was born from blind. I don't even know which direction the pool of Siloam is. When the Lord gives you a command, don't give him an excuse. Now he could have easily have given an excuse by saying, I'm blind. I, I, how am I supposed to get there? I don't, I don't know which way the pool of Siloam is. Jesus, I'm, I'm turning around. He didn't give an excuse, he gave obedience. He says, listen, go and wash in the pool called scent. Go wash, go wash, go wash. It was predicated on his obedience. Had he not gone where he was sent, he never would have received his healing. May I say it this way? That the blessing you seek is waiting for you in a place called obedience. The blessing that you seek is waiting for you in a place called obedience. The blessing that you seek is waiting for you in a place called obedience, obedience. Maybe I need to say it this way. Your place of appointing is also your place of anointing. Wherever God has appointed you, that's where you, that's where you find your anointing. If he's appointed you as a prophet, that's where you find it, your anointing. If he's appointed you as a mother, that's where you find your anointing. If he's appointed you as a father, that's where you find your anointing. Your place of appointing is your place of anointing. I just love it when I go to a place and see people that are operating in their anointing. Have you ever gone into a restaurant and you're served by people that you could tell that's not their anointing? They're just trying to get through acting school or whatever, you know, whatever they're trying to do. But you can tell this ain't it. You're just trying to make a little money to keep your utilities on because they don't have the grace. Your place of appointing is your place of anointing. When you go where you're sent, my God, there's a power. There's, there's an anointing that, that flows in you and through you. And when you, get, when you get on your way, just when you get on your way to where God has sent you, 
sending you, you'll find everything that you need. You remember the ten leopards? They were healed as they, as they went. They were healed as they, as they went. They were sent, but they didn't get healed until they, until they went. And that's what we have to do. We have to go, and we'll find our healing. There are some people that I found folks in ministry, and, and I know that we need time to heal and to restore but sometimes your greatest healing comes by operating in your anointing even when you don't feel like it. I cannot tell you how many times if I wasn't physically feeling well and when I stepped into my anointing, I got healed in the process. Sometimes my wife would come out here to lead worship. She'd be sick at home and as she operated in her gift, pow, here comes a healing. I'm just here to tell you that when you go where he sends you, you may not feel like it, but he knows something that you don't know. If you'll just obey it, if you'll just go, I'm just telling you, you feel better when you get out. You know, if you're sick at home, you're going to still be sick. You're still going to be feeling bad at home. I'm just here to tell you, when you get up and put some powder on your face, you look better and you feel better. My God, there's something about going. I'm telling you, God will bless you when you go. Better than when you're just laying at home in the bed, just still just rolling around and depressed and don't even want to wash your face. Wash it anyway and go. Let the sunshine hit you. Listen to the birds sing. Inhale some fresh air. Look at some green grass. Look up at the sky. Speak to somebody. When God calls you, his next step is to send you. When he calls you, remember he chooses you, then he calls you, then he sends you. But when God calls you, his next step is to send you. Where has the Lord sent you that you have not yet gone? Selah. Where has the Lord sent you that you've not yet gone? And I want you to realize this. I just tell you, get going and then you'll get sent. Because if you want to get something done, you got to give it to busy people. You wonder why in the world the people come and always ask you to do stuff and you already got stuff to do? Because if you want to get something done, ask a person who's already getting stuff done. You will not find an instance where God just goes to an idle person sitting up under a tree, sipping on lemonade or iced tea, you know, just enjoying the beauty of the day. Whenever God calls somebody, he always interrupted something that they were doing. When he called Gideon, Gideon was threshing wheat by the wine press. When he called David, David was serving as a shepherd boy down there keeping and tending the sheep. When he called Peter and John, they were already operating as professional fishermen. When God called Elisha, Elisha was sitting there plowing with 12 yoke of oxen there behind these things, tilling up the soil. I'm telling you, God went to people that were busting a move that were already doing something. And if God's going to call you and use you for his glory, he's going to find you already operating in something. So here's my suggestion to you. Get going and you'll get called and sent. Get going and you'll get called and sent. Get going and you'll get called and sent. It's amazing. And you know... I finally reached the age where, you know, when you're a teenager, these are people that are sneaking out of their beds to go to a party. But when you get to be my age, you sneak out of a party to go to bed. <laughs> you know, when you're younger, I meant to take a nap is punishment. You get to be my age to take a nap is a... My God, it's a blessing. It's a delight. It's like, whoo, thank you, Jesus. What has he sent you to do? Has he sent you to start a business? Has he sent you to start a ministry? Has he sent you to plant a church? Has he sent you to reconcile with somebody who has offended you? Has he sent you to serve somebody else's vision? Has he sent sent you to help other people that are suffering with what God delivered you from? Has he sent you to create something that expresses beauty and creativity in the earth? You're sent for something. 
And just remember that the Great Commission is a command to go. The Great Commission. It is a command to go. The Great Commission is a command to go. We are sent on a mission. We're sent on a mission. It's not just an entertainment cruise. It's not a dinner cruise. When you go on a dinner cruise, you don't have any ports of call. You just go out and sort of circle around and come back to the same place. But when you go cruising, you have ports of call. You have ports of call. So you have particular destinations that you know when you go on a cruise that I'm going to this port and that port and this port and that port. And it gives meaning and definition and you understand that I'm going somewhere and I'm going to disembark. I'm going to get off and I'm going to see a place that I perhaps have not seen before. The Great Commission is always a commission to go. And it's amazing that though there were several prophets and teachers in Antioch, in Acts chapter 13, there were, uh, I think, at least about four of them, five of them, four or five that were mentioned there, but the Holy Ghost said in the midst of their praying, separate from me Barnabas and Saul. I just want those two. And this is to let you know not everybody is sent on the same mission. That sometimes you can be in a midst of prophets and God will call you to do something that he didn't give anybody else a call to. That if it's nothing but taking food down to people who are living up under a bridge, and if that is your call, you obey the call that where he sends you to do. If he calls you to go to a place, you know, you go. I never will forget I was praying in the Holy Ghost uh, for a, a, a solid hours during my teenage years uh, in, in the morning. And I remember distinctly one morning, uh, instead of my interpreting in English uh, what I had been praying in the Holy Ghost, I saw it in vision form. And I saw people from all over the world with various turbans on their heads, dots in their heads. And uh, I, it, it started out as, as golden uh, wheat in a field. And I saw it blowing in the wind, and all of a sudden, the wheat that was blowing in the wind turned into hands beckoning, saying, come, 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 come. And I mean, and I've been to nearly 100 nations around the world, and I didn't invite myself to any of them. Somebody said to me, come, come, come. And until the master bids you come, you have no authority to go. And I'm just telling you, he's called us for purpose. Before we are sent, we need to make sure that we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Before we are sent, you make sure that you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And here's what I would say to you. Seeking God's kingdom requires our practicing spiritual disciplines of various things. Spiritual disciplines. If you really want to seek first the kingdom of God, it requires our practicing spiritual disciplines. One is solitude, solitude. Solitude means get alone, get alone. You're with folks all the time. You always got something in your ears, something before your eyes. If we go someplace and get bored, the first thing we do is, is to pull out our digital distraction. You need solitude, solitude, get alone, get alone. Then you need silence, get quiet. Sometimes you're alone, but you're not quiet. We get along, we talking to ourselves. Wonder why they do me like that when you did. <laughs> Just get along and close your mouth. Just get along. Solitude, silence, silence. The third one is private prayer. Private prayer. Get to praying. Get to praying. Get alone. Get quiet. Get to praying. Then meditation in the Word. Get to study in your Bible. Get to study in your Bible. And then finally, get listening to God. Get listening to God. Get the ear of your heart open because that raises your sights and it attunes your heart to the plans and the purposes of God. When you come into the spiritual disciplines of solitude, get alone, silence, get quiet, private prayer, get praying, meditation in the Word of God, get studying, and listening to God. Get listening. Attuning your ear to the heart of God. 
And you know what happens when you do that? You conceive divine ideas that then materialize in divine action and they are expressed through the beauty of divine creativity. Whenever you get along with God, you'll get divine ideas that will express themselves. It'll materialize in divine action that expresses itself in the beauty of divine creativity. That's what Jacob did. Jacob spent the night with God. And if you ever spend the night with God, you'll get up with his baby. When you spend the night with God, you have a conception, a concept. An idea divinely. Whenever you'll just spend time with God, if you can ever pull away from the crowd, pull away from your social media, and come into solitude and silence. And I'm telling you, and to, you get to that place where you've meditated in the Word, and now you have a listening ear to attune yourself to the voice of God. Something powerful happens. Notice Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Now notice, He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted. Sent me, sent to comfort, sent to comfort, and to proclaim the captives uh, will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of the Lord's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. You see, this passage is the same passage that Jesus quoted in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to open, you know, the eyes of the blind. He's, he sent me, you know, to all of these things. And so now, may we be sent and join him in his work. Remember what Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, I want you to notice that. Look at where it says, in Jerusalem. That's where they were. It starts at home. When you talk, you know what your, your Jerusalem, you know who you're sent to? Your Jerusalem is your family and your friends. These are people that you know, that's your Jerusalem. Judea, you know what Judea is? They are the people of the same culture and the same language in nearby towns. That's Decatur in Fayetteville and <laughs> Gwinnett County and uh, Douglasville. You know, <laughs> you, know you, you got to go, folks of the same culture, same language in nearby towns. And then Samaria, you know what Samaria is? People of near but different cultures and or languages. They're near but of different cultures and or language. And then the ends of the earth, this is people outside of your country's boundaries where missionaries learn another language and another culture, and they go there with a gospel mission. Now, here's what I want you to get. We don't get to choose the place that God sends us. We get to choose to be faithful in the place he sends us. But sometimes, you know, you'll be complaining, God, why did you send me over here? I don't want to be over here. We don't get to choose the place that God sends us. We get to choose to be faithful in the place he sends us. We don't get to choose our mission field. We get to be faithful in the mission field where God calls us. I flew in last night when I came into the airport and I was riding the plane train. I noticed a young, white young man that got on the train I'm a discerner, and I'm a prophetic guy. I noticed he got on the, on the train as I was at the T-Con course, and you know the next stop then is baggage clean. He's getting on the train at the T-Con course. And something said to me, 
Ask him if he's going to baggage claim or some other concourse. And I said, young man, are you going to the baggage claim? He's, he, he said, no. I said, then you're trying to get on the wrong train. I said, your train is over on that side. You go there. I sent him to the train that was going to take him to his destination. Now, that was a train car full of folks. But I was the only one who discerned that he'd gotten on the wrong train, headed in the wrong direction. And when we're sent, we are sent to talk to people that's on the wrong train, headed in the wrong direction. And all I did was sent him to the right train that was going to take him to the right concourse for his departure. And another white man said to me immediately after the young man exited the train, he said, that was awfully kind of you. But I thought how cruel it would be for me to know the way and not open my mouth. I am sent. I know the way. I have an ordination from God to be able to tell people no matter where they are. If you're on the wrong train, I can redirect anybody. My directions are always consistent. Turn right and keep straight. Turn right, keep straight. It is a thing called repentance. If you ever redirect somebody and send them where they are to go, whenever man turns, it's called repentance. To repent means to turn to turn to change your mind it's a turn whenever man turns it's called repentance whenever God turns it's called transformation but whenever God and man turn it's called revolution and I'm just here to tell you that God is up to something in the earth there's a revolution going on and it will not be televised my God, you have to be there in the place to be able to lay hands on sick, hurting people that don't have a digital device to be able to get ministry. God has to send us to them. He has to send us to discourage people, to depress people who won't get out. He didn't say, come. He said, go into all of the world. Go into the nooks and the crannies. Go into their drug places. Go into that, that, that crack houses. Go into those places. And folks that's on the wrong train, they're taking them to the wrong de destination. They say, hey, hey, it's this way. You're looking for peace, it's this way. You're looking for life, it's this way. You're looking for a rest for your soul, this way. You're sent. God sent Jesus. Jesus sent the Holy Ghost. And God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost are sending you you're it and whether or not you realize it you are sent on a mission by God himself you carry something whatever God has done for you and in you and to you he now wants to do through you it's your time tag you're it you're sent you're sent you're sent, start in your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. If you've ever been on drugs, if you've ever been an alcoholic, you know that look in their eyes. If you've ever been molested, you know what it is to look into the eyes of a person that turns downward and the shame and the guilt that they carry. If you've ever been there, you know that look in their eyes. You're sent for them. Go to them in the name of Jesus. How dare we let somebody get on the great train headed in the wrong direction and we not open our mouths. He says, this is the way. I love it whenever I've been lost and somebody just says, follow me. 
That's what Jesus said. If you're found, you're authorized to tell them, follow me, follow me, follow me. The apostle Paul, the apostolos, the sent one, said it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. As long as you're following Jesus, you are sent. If he has healed you, show other people the healing bread. Lead them to the healing bread. If he has delivered you, lead them to the deliverer. My God, if he has set you free, lead them, tell them of your story. You are sent. You are sent. You are sent. How dare you sit when you are sent? You're sent. I commission you by the authority of God himself who sent his son Jesus, who sent the Holy Ghost. By God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, you are the church. It's not about how many we sit. It's about how many we send in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Go to your Jerusalem. Go to your Judea. Go to your Samaria. Go to the uttermost parts of the world. Go across the hall and talk to somebody in your apartment complex. Go across the street. Go, go, go. And he will go with you. And he will deliver through. And he'll heal through your hands. When he's coming back, he'll say, I was sick and in prison and you didn't come to visit me. When were you, Lord, in any of these conditions? He says, because you did it not unto the least of those, the brethren, you didn't do it to me. He says, you don't recognize that the person who's down and out. I drove by a store on my way to minister yesterday morning in Phoenix. The name of it was Down and Out. And if you ever find people and you realize that they have lost their wind and you've got the breath of the Holy Ghost in you, how dare we not use our mouth to encourage, to lift up, to edify, to build. He that prophesieth, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, he that prophesieth speaketh to men and women to exhortation, edification, and comfort. It is a ministry where God gives you something on the inside of you. How can you sit when you have something so strong inside? How can you sit when Jesus, whenever he sees one of his children in trouble, he's no longer sitting. He's standing. He's standing. When Stephen was being stoned, the heavens opened up. And he saw Jesus standing. And I declare to you that if you'll go since, go where he sent you, Jesus will stand. You'll not go in your own strength. You walk in the strength of Jesus that is standing at the right hand of the Father. Whenever he sees you on your mission, Jesus stands up and he says, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. I've already given you the power for this. Heal the sick. Open the eyes of the blind. Cleanse the lepers. Go! And I will go with you. And as this man, blind from birth, had never seen, it is God's way of prophetically saying to you that there are some things that you have never seen God do. That your eyes are getting ready to see when you get sent. You'll see God use you. God use you in ways that you have never seen before in the name of Jesus. I know you've heard about outstanding miracles, Catherine Kuhlman and Maria Woodworth. You've heard of them. You've seen them in history, but it's your time now. 
This time God's not sending the superstars. This time he's activating his body, the body, the body of Christ. Those that don't rule by a title, the ones that have a position of anointing because they are sent. Because they have said, Lord, here am I. Here am I, Lord, send me, send me, send me, send me. Stand to your feet, stand to your feet. I want you to just say, Lord, I'm available to you. Because he's looking for available people. But say, God, if you, if you need to send somebody on my job, in my neighborhood, in my school, Lord, I'm available to you at the airport, at Walmart, at Target, at Kroger, at Publix. When I go to get my treatment at the hospital, if you need somebody, God, even while I'm dealing with my own issues, <laughs> Lord, use me. Send me, Jesus. At the nursing home, send me. the empower he's just looking for available vessels that will say Lord if there's anything that you can use in my life from my testimony from my story of deliverance from my breakthrough from my struggle if anybody else can benefit from my pain Lord use it for your glory for your glory for your glory he wants to send you send you in the places that you've not yet been and you will watch and see God do something in dry places in dark places in lonely places in depressed places in sick places he's just looking for somebody I'm available. I am available. So rich.
Father, today we avail our hearts to you. And we say that whatever we have in our lives that can be used for your glory, then God use it. And we covenant in advance that we will give you all of the glory for it, all of the honor for it, all of the praise for it. Thank you, God, for the privilege of serving you, of being ones that are sent, and that when we go, Lord, that we will see. We will see. Others will taste. And we will see your goodness in the earth, O oh Lord. Lord, anoint our hands to be able to transmit your healing and delivering power. Anoint our tongues to be able to speak your word prophetically and bring peace and encouragement and comfort and strength into the lives of others. I pray, God, that you will give us hearts to be able to discern that we might be empathetic and show our compassion. The compassion of Jesus will flow from us to hurting people, to lonely people. God, minister through us. You've done great things in us. Now, God, do it through us. May you send us as your hands and your feet as your mouth, as your ears, for your glory. As we leave this place, Father, may we go with a keen recognition that we are sent as ambassadors by you. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.